question I might have is the size of the bins. Are they standard size? Yep, so we have two standard, the largest being 57 by 57 by 71. Those are if they're in the locked like transfer station or something like that. And then our other ones typically are around 47 inches. Okay. So they're like the ones you see out this in the community. Right yeah. Turn it up for me. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, somebody's mic there was active. Um, you said you made reference to something you typically see where curbside? Like if you drive around and see clothing donation bins, we have this smaller size as well with the handle. I got it. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, and the and the number of bins, uh, is there a maximum number um, that we would uh, be looking at? Or is it unlimited as to how many we could get? It? It's really up to you. I think like for a size of yours, I think less than five would be more than enough. The town of Drake, it, we just placed five bins throughout their town. Um, but, you know, okay. some yep. towns have 12, but. Yep. And uh, as far as the items um, that you folks are able to collect, I know that I think textiles is a major element, right, of what you collect? Yeah, so in our clothing donation bins, that would be anything essentially that's made of fabric, shoes, curtains, linens, towels, you know, anything that you wear. And we provide you all of that marketing material. And then for our curbside free home pickup, we're able to accept all of those textile items, but then also bicycles, pots, pans, books, DVDs, anything essentially that's a household item that can fit in a large Amazon box. Oh, great. Excellent. Okay. Um, and I know there is, uh, we talked about this before, there's something that's coming down and just this is more for our listeners. There's a change coming um, with mm -hmm. regard to legislation uh, in terms of um, what folks are going to be able to recycle, or what they'll have to recycle versus what they can throw out. Uh, could you, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Right. Yes. Yep. So there is a textile waste ban starting November 1st. That says that no longer can textiles, clothing, anything like that go into the waste stream. It has to be donated or you know, given away. The only exception is items that are extremely smelly, anything that's wet, moldy, or overly soiled. Those are able to go into the waste stream because those are contaminated but we're helping cities and towns get into that legislation compliance and making it accessible to everyone through bins as well as the curbside pickup. Great, excellent. Yeah, I just wanted to folks out there to, who are listening to kind of be aware of what this yep. is kind of all about and the benefits of, uh, of the program. Um, and one thing that I did not mention is we are a for-profit company, however, our we have really long-term partnerships, like I said, with Big Brothers Big Sisters, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and St. Vincent de Paul. Last year, our nonprofit partners received $992,493 in unrestricted funding. And how does that funding uh, come, come back? Um, that is based on tonnage, I assume, right? The Our partnership with our nonprofits, unfortunately, I can't discuss the exact, you know, dealings of the contract, but we're able to help them with unrestricted funding. It's another way, rather than having people open their wallets to, you know, donate money, they're able to donate clothing to support the organizations. Okay, great, excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, we have the, uh, you're probably familiar with the pink bag, what well, we call it the pink bag program, but simple mm -hmm. recycling. And so that was, that worked. And unfortunately, like Alan pointed out, it was something that uh, wasn't able to, uh, they weren't able to stay with us. So um, we're glad we have you folks coming on board to kind of take over. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great program. It's a great opportunity for folks. And I think it's going to be very beneficial um, from a recycling standpoint and also from the standpoint of maybe easing up, you know, our costs maybe on the tonnage side of things mm -hmm. from our trash program that will help subscribers who will participate in that. So that's great. Absolutely. We're here to help and anything that we can do to work together, we're here for you. Excellent. 
That's all I, I had. I don't know if, uh, is, if Joyce is on yet. Do we know? Jack, and Joyce, Joyce is, on. is on? Yep, Joyce is on. And so, for uh, COVID, we never closed even one day. We've hmm. been around for 35 years. And so that's something that you can be confident in our partnership is we're here for the long run. Great. Uh, I am on. Uh, I'm Joyce Gilmore, um, the last member. Hi, um, Joyce. I, I'm ex really excited about it, this because to me it's really an important thing. Um, do, do you donate, uh, like, if if we uh, put in, like, really good clothing and stuff like that, does that get donated to a, a, another group that could use it? Um so you go some, through your stuff, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. So in special, like we collected 25 million pounds of clothing last year. So if there's certain groups that need specific things that we can help them, for example, there was a fire department last month that was doing special training and they wanted to have their mannequins have clothes on for their trainings. We were able to provide clothes for them or if there's organizations through St. Vincent de Paul that they need help, then yes, we do. But we are a wholesaler typically, so we don't sort the clothing. Okay. Jack, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, but I will uh, look for the contract from Taylor later on this evening. Perfect. I'll sign that right over. I'll send that over right after the call. Do you want me to stay on the call for your discussion, or um, or are you guys gonna talk about that later? Uh, most likely, we'll talk about that later once I have the contract. I will review it with each board member. Okay, perfect. So I'll send that, and if you have any questions or need anything from me, just let me know. I know where to find you. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I really look forward to the potential of working together. Thank you, Taylor. Great, thanks, Thank Taylor. Thank you very much, Jill. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Okay, so the next meeting topic is the rooster noise nuisance follow-up, and I do believe I have Ann Mazzarelli on the conference call with us. Ann, would you like to start off? She's unmuted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the neighbor 18B, Neck Hill Road, uh, supposedly got rid of the original rooster, which was crowing starting at like 3.40 a.m. for the last, well, probably for the last year, but we started complaining, of, complaining and sending emails about it um, a little over a month ago. And um, as of August 31st, he supposedly got rid of that rooster. However, I started hearing another rooster the following day on September 1st. A little later, it's like starts at 6 a.m. It's the crowing isn't as long and it's it's loud. Um, it seemed a little muffled at first, but it seems to be getting louder and louder. Um, it doesn't crow as long, but the fact of the matter is it's crowing before 7 a.m. And I am just afraid we give this person an inch, he's going to take a mile, and then the next thing you know, it's going to be crowing at 4 a.m. again, like it has for the, you know, for the past six months. So that's my concern about that. Uh, I will just say, this is Joyce Gilmore. I will just say this to you, that I have been over there every day, and that rooster is not there. So if you would like to go over, she has invited you to come over and see that the rooster is not there. Um, and if you want me to go over with you and see that the rooster is not there, I'm happy to do that with you. If, if, if that would, but that rooster is gone. Right, the original rooster, and that's what I said. But there is another rooster, I've been hearing it. It's coming directly from the property. I sent a recording of it on, I forget what day it was, September 5th or 6th. It starts at six o'clock, just after six in the morning. And it's it's 
it's still crawling. It's still crawling before 7 a.m. So granted, this probably isn't the original rooster that, that they had, but they did get another rooster because I've been hearing it every morning at, starting at 6 a.m. So what I'm saying is he's not complying in that it's still crowing before 7 a.m. And I thought that that's what the agreement was as far as compliance goes and the noise issue. Well, I'll go over there again. I was there yesterday, so uh, there was no rooster. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm a, I've had chickens all my life here. So I know a rooster when I see it, but I will go unless they were hiding that rooster. Someplace. That's possible. I, That's I, very possible. It crowed this afternoon. It, it crowed this. My husband's here. It crowed this afternoon. There is a rooster there. I don't. I don't see. Him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it's coming directly from the property. We live right next to our bedroom window faces a property. Well, I'll I'll go so. again tomorrow. And I, I mean, and he could. They could be hiding it. I mean, didn't you mention at one of the meetings you could put it in? He could put it in his cellar, you know, to, to stop the noise. So that's a possibility. But I just want you to know that we're hearing the crowing. It's just after 6 a.m. So he must have gotten another rooster. So until a regulation is put through that, uh, you know, the crowing has to can't start before 7 a.m. Um, this is just going to continue, you know, so. And now we got rats. Well, uh, you you and a lot of other people around the whole town, I just actually went out this afternoon and saw a rat. And I live, I'm up in the center of town, and I had a rat that was run over right in front of my house. And I haven't seen a rat for years, but uh, I have talked to over 10 people in all different parts of town that are complaining about rats. And it is, it's, I did some research again, and uh, like if you look in Attleboro, they're complaining, in Providence, they're complaining, all, all over the place, it, they're, they're complaining about rats. It's, it's a, it is a real problem. Now, is it just a coincidence that uh, all of a sudden in our neighborhood, there's like five uh, owners that have chickens and we've been here 33 years and never saw a rat ever. I mean, is it just coincidence that all of a sudden, because there's chickens in a residential neighborhood, now we have rats? Well, I, I, I don't think that it's necessarily coincidental. I think that it's that if you if you look, if you go and do some research about rats now, you will see that because it has to do with the drought that they're coming to different places. I mean, I, I just talked to two women on Millville Street. They don't have chickens. They don't have roosters. They don't have animals. And they one of them had a um, exterminator come yesterday. And uh, he told them, too, that it, it's, it's a huge problem universally, not just on Daniels Road or uh, Neck Hill Road. It, it is all over the place. And I mean, I have one. I live in. I'm in the center of town, and I I just had a dead rat on the. As I went out this afternoon, I I couldn't believe it. I said to my husband, "This is a, a, a there's a dead rat. Somebody ran over a rat. We haven't had rats ever." But I mean, is it true that rats are, you know, going for chickens? I mean, is that an unusual we, thing? I mean, with poor in the neighborhood, all of a sudden we have. Eat rats on on the streets where there are mm. chickens. I mean, I know you're not going to get rid of the chickens, but to me, it seems like you need some kind of regulation. You need to know who in the town has chickens so that you can go and check these things out. I mean, <laughs> it's it's just I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, I mean we still have a crowing rooster. Yeah. I don't know. If it, you know this guy's a magician and he just like you know it, it, it's there, it's not there. It's yeah. there every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's there every day. I heard it this afternoon. We heard it this morning early. I mean, it's, if there's a regulation where you can take the rooster out because it's a nuisance, and this clearly is a nuisance, it should be taken away. I mean, this guy hasn't complied at all. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, know. it's making it's a fool just... out of everybody to me. Mm -hmm.
Alan or Tom, would you like to chime in? Uh, yes, I would. Um, as far as, you know, is there a correlation between chickens and rats? Chickens are one of the things, one of the many things that could attract rats. Um, it, it all depends upon the uh, keeper of the chickens and how clean mm -hmm. they keep the goop. Right. Um, but it, th this is uh, a, a very wide scope problem. Um, if you go on the website, uh, you will see that there are a lot of towns that are having this is issue all over Massachusetts. Um, there are, there's more than, you know, one food source. And uh, there's a lot of things that have lined up, uh, according to the professionals, uh, along with they're not only seeking food, they're seeking water. Um, so they're, they're more visible. Um, it's something that's going to take uh, a, a lot of people doing a lot of different things to try to control the situation. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, Jack, I, I had told you about West Boylston. I know you included that in our uh, packet. Um, you know, it, 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 unfortunately, it's a statewide problem, so we can't blame it just on chickens. People have had chickens in town. Uh, for a long, long time, but chickens are one of the things that may attract them. Um, again, things have just kind of lined up uh, an extreme drought. Uh, they look, you know, these rodents, unfortunately, are looking for everything. And they're not, they're looking for food. They're looking for shelter. They're looking for water. Um, again, it's going to take a lot of people doing a lot of good practices uh, in order to, uh, you know, combat this. Fortunately, uh, well, I'm hoping it's fortunate. Cooler weather will be coming. Uh, we've had more rain. Hopefully they'll uh, go back into the wild, so to speak, uh, and not be as visible. Uh, I'm sure that they've always been here, um, although we rarely see them. Uh, so, we, we, you know, we can't blame it on chickens. Um, that's just one thing that can attract them. Um, Tom, anybody else like to uh, comment? Uh, before Tom, can I, I do have Brendan Chanel with his hand raised, if he can go first. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Brendan Chanel, 16 Washington Street. And just to add on a little bit, so I've had chickens for about eight years now, and I've never seen a rat until this year. Um, but like you said, it's very important to maintain cleanliness because if you have food out in the open, it's going to attract animals, you know, kind of common sense. So you have to uh, make sure you lock up your food at night, make sure that you store your food in a metal bin where rodents can't get in and, you know, really best practices to keep it from com becoming a problem. But yeah, I've, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. I've, I've seen a couple of rats this year and I've, I've never seen these before ever. We also have Richard Green with his hand raised. Does any, anybody inspect where chickens are kept to see if they are being kept cleanly or because we had an exterminator here and they said they wouldn't even come here because if you have chickens, the rats are going to eat on the food and they're going to eat on chicken feces. Does anybody inspect them? I believe our animal inspector uh, inspects all livestock on an annual basis. Uh, I know our annual uh, our animal inspector comes to the horse barn that I rent on George Street and inspects my uh, horses every year. Uh, I actually have the, uh, the what they call the the barn book. I have the sheet in front of me. Uh, and the sheet lists uh, a wide variety of uh, livestock and poultry is number seven on that list from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. So the animal inspector, unless he doesn't know of the existence of that livestock, does come out on an annual basis. Uh, and I was inspected on October 28th of 21. That was the last time that I was inspected and I uh, 
I, I would assume that I'll see them again sometime uh, this October. Do you have to register? Okay. Do you have to register with someone that you have horses? Uh, I have never registered with so with someone. Uh, I had. How do they know you have horses? They're pretty visible. You can't hide them. Well, like the chickens though. Expect... Chickens well, are in the, the backyard animal... someplace. Yeah, I, I, I agreed. Um, but you know, the word, word gets around with people that have livestock. Anybody else? I do have staff FGN sales who has their hand raised, then Jolina Rich. Maybe she got first. Good evening. Uh, uh, this is Rip Sokol, staff at FGN sales. We also are the owner of Feeds and Needs in Menden. And uh, we certainly can offer some uh interesting information about rodent problems we have been in business for i think it's 16 years at this point and over that time we have repeatedly dealt with infestations of chipmunks mice once red squirrels and only in the past six months, give or take, have we had to deal with rats. And insofar as the conversation I've heard this evening, I can offer a first-hand testimony. We have an inventory of about $50,000 and probably uh, 15 tons of various grain at any point in time. And the chicken feed is probably the one item that we sell that is safest. Rats do not prefer it. Uh, insofar as the rats themselves, I can tell you that although we had not seen any in years uh i first spotted some uh i believe in march and i recognized that one of the key problems in attracting the rats was that we had one staff member who insisted on putting a pound and a half of dry cat food out for our one cat once or twice every day. And I saw evidence that other animals, whether it be skunk, rat, whatever, I was not sure, but other animals were consuming it. Uh, we subsequently have uh, expended about $6,000, uh, certainly over 5,000 in uh, rodent control measures, uh, we have recently uh, started finally to see a downtrend in evidence of uh, rat activity. But going back to the feed portion, uh, the chicken feed is the one thing that I can safely leave almost anywhere in our uh, warehouses and rats rarely bother chicken feed. Their favorite seems to be cat and dog food. Uh, next to that would be any sweet horse feed. Uh, sweet goat feed has uh, once been attacked. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but the uh, primary targets of the rodents seem to be the uh, feeds that are treated with molasses. Many horse feeds are textured, so they are a target. The one goat feed that was attacked was a uh, molasses textured goat feed. The pelleted non-molasses goat feed 
sheep feed and chicken feed are rarely, if ever, bothered. So that might uh, pertain somewhat to your conversation. And certainly we do not need to uh, condemn any particular animal. It's the availability of the feed. And as an earlier speaker commented, keeping it in galvanized metal containers and dealing properly with your trash. Uh, that leftover portion of hamburger or uh, sandwich that goes into the uh, trash bin or the dumpster <laughs> will feed a rat for several days. And so I think that uh, any control measures need to take that into account. I uh, thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Uh, Jolena Rich, you have your hand raised. This is actually your husband, David, and uh, thank you for uh, holding this tonight. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, we've been in the center of town for over 20 years or so, and we have never, ever seen a rat. Uh, last couple of months, we've been watching the rats in our neighborhood. Uh, not only at night, but in the daytime, we see them running around. And it was only recently someone moved in uh, a few months ago, several months ago, and they have chickens. Uh, I don't know if there's a coincidence to this. I, I'm not an expert in goat food or anything like that, but it just seems kind of funny that people are starting to mention this, correlating uh, seeing rats with chickens. Um, I don't necessarily think it's the chicken food, but maybe the smell of the chickens or the droppings. And the rats seem to be in this particular area around the chickens constantly. Rats don't stick around if there's no food. So I don't know why they're sticking around this area. And the only thing that's different are the chickens. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just trying to add this to as information to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will say that in the last uh, maybe four months, there was a rat complaint um, over on Gaskell Road. And adjacent this property is a hobbyist who raises birds. And the chairman of the board at the time uh, went with the animal inspector and inspected that property. Uh, no sign of rats. And the property and the animals were absolutely pristine. Um, so even though the neighbor had complained about rats and had seen rats and had their pets bringing dead rats home to their house, this hobbyist that had, you know, multiple birds of different kinds, uh, sheep, goats, etc. Um, it was highly, highly unlikely that he, you know, he was attracting them. Um, from what I read in information that Jack has provided the board members with, um, rats will travel a great distance um, for a food or water source. Um, so it, it's very possible that this is what's happening. Um, Rip Sokol, who spoke before, who owns Feeds and Needs, um, thank you very much. I, I would consider him uh, an expert in, in what he does. I first met him probably 40 years ago at Western Nurseries. Um, he has been in the, the nursery and feed business uh, for a, a very long time, and I'm sure he's seen it all. So, you know, based on his uh, experience uh, and with the amount of feed that he has on hand uh, and the information that he's provided us with, um, I know there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people out there that feed wild cats. They leave some food out there for them. Um, we definitely have our share of cats and dogs uh, in town. Um, we all love our animals, uh, so it, it's very possible 
that our domesticated animals and the domesticated food, based on what Rip is saying, uh, could be uh, a partial uh, attraction uh, for these rodents. It's definitely not just one thing. Um, it's availability of food, availability of water, uh, and we have a lot of things uh, that have lined up according to the uh, rodent control people um, the weather has been a big, uh, uh, influence on, on what's going on, but, uh, obviously based on what Rip is saying, we, we all probably need to, to look at, and see how we're taking care of our domesticated animals, our cats and dogs, and how we're, uh, and where we locate their food. Um, so like I said, this is going to be kind of a, a multi-prong, everybody's going to have to do their part, um, process uh, to protect our community and i believe uh this was brought up uh a couple meetings ago by a um uh daniel's road uh resident who i see is on tonight uh, so you know this is not my idea this is uh something that she said that you know uh, i'm just repeating and i totally agree with everybody has to kind of do their thing uh, and, and think clearly of, you know, you know, how they bag their trash, how long they put their trash out before the trash pickup is, uh, you know, maybe putting it out the night before might be convenient, but might not be a good idea. It might be a good idea to do it at six o'clock in the morning where pickup starts at seven. Thank you. Okay. Tom Fickner, uh, could you, uh, chime in on this for me, please? To be honest, I don't know where to go with this topic. Uh, I think it's multifaceted. Um, I, you know, I do believe that um, we may be looking at this particular season as potentially being a bit of a perfect storm scenario with the with the drought playing into it, uh, causing rodents to kind of emerge from their normal area of habitat seeking food and water. Um, I do know that, or it seems to be that there's a correlation of at least representation of chickens in a neighborhood when, when folks have been reporting rat problems. That seems to be consistent. Um, I thank Rick for his input from Feeds and Needs. I, I found that very enlightening um, with what he spoke to regarding um, his experience with the type of feed and what ro rodents uh, in his experience have seemed to go for and not go for. Um, I just, I personally just don't know uh, where to where to take this to try to assist. I, I know that, um, you know, every homeowner is entitled to, you know, protect their property um, and utilize services that would um, mitigate rodent infestation. I know that there's folks out there that also have concerns about the use of um, such components that could create secondary problems for other natural, uh, you know, other creatures out there, owls, hawks, and things of that nature that you don't want to disturb or you don't want to affect. Um, I, you know, I'm not just not sure what uh, what is the best approach for trying to resolve this. I do like what I believe it was one of the residents had said at the last meeting that Alan alluded to. I believe that it probably a great approach from a neighborhood perspective if a neighborhood feels affected um, to do what they can as a group to mitigate the rodent infestation in the neighborhood as opposed to just one property applying some application. Um, you know, I know that um, the, the concept of uh, feral cats out there uh, being potentially uh, effective or believing to be effective at eliminating rodents in a neighborhood um, seemed to be a, a solution but I guess if what Rick says, if there's a 
if there's an element out there where folks are putting um, pet food or cat food outside feeding their feral cats, um, is that actually creating a conflict and that actually that food could be actually an attraction for the rodent as well as what they're trying to do by having the feral cat, you know, available to eliminate the rodent. I don't know if that's a catch 22 scenario or what. Um, I just, um, I don't know where to go with it, to be honest with you. I, I believe that, you know, part of this is probably, um, you know, and I think Brendan talked about this earlier, um, the keeping of the animals, right? I, um, how they're keeping their food, keeping it, uh, you know, in containers, even though it might be believed that chicken, you know, food or feed might not be the attraction, but properly keeping their, the pens clean and whatnot, there may be some elements of the cleanliness that are potentially attracting the rodents um, to the area. Uh, and un unfortunately right now at the moment, um, we don't have any kind of uh, 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 regulation uh, or permitting with regard to chickens. You know, we had been talking about rooster permitting, but with regard to chickens, that's something that um, for the most part, it goes under the radar. Uh, we, as Alan pointed out, we do have a barn book. We have, you know, some known locations where there's livestock in place, but I, you know, I think that more geared toward the larger types of animals, horses, goats. I don't know if, you know, for all these residences out there that have been doing the chickens uh, in the last couple of years, I believe it's been an increase in that uh, with what's going on with uh, COVID. Um, the people produce their own eggs. Um, I just, I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure where to go. Alan? Okay, are you Brendan with his hand raised? Brendan? Thank you again, uh, Brendan, Chanel 16, Washington. I, I just had a few comments about the previous speaker's um, statements. Um, the, the first being um, uh, the, the barn book and the inspection of, of chickens. Um, so that that's something that, you know, honestly, I, I've had chickens quite a while now. I, I, I would not um, be opposed to that. I, I think my uh, my coop would, would show well and and I welcome any constructive you know, criticism or feedback of how to improve it. Uh, the second um, point is that I, I think, you know, being a uh, being a, a hobbyist of chickens myself, I, I appreciate the ability to to um, to grow my own food, basically, and, I, and I'm trying to do that as much as I can to, to help feed the family. Um, and I think it's a, a relatively responsible thing to do, but you, you have to do it, you know, correctly. Um, and I had another point, but I, I forgot what it was. Oh, actually, yeah, one more. Um, so you said you, I'm wondering if if the role that the Board of Health could you know, facilitate here would be kind of an awareness campaign, since this is going to need a multifaceted approach with basically everyone attacking the rodent problem if they find it on their property because so that there's no safe havens. Maybe uh, some sort of resource packet or, or something for homeowners could be something that could be mailed to the to the residents, because I bet there's a lot of people that don't know this is going on and they, you know, don't go out at, on their property at night and they don't see the, the problem. So. Um, unless they know about it they're not going to act so that's it thanks okay rick from uh fees and needs you have your hand raised i hope i'm uh <laughs> unmuted now <laughs> you are thank you um as far as the common denominator in this uh, at least statewide, if not nationwide problem. Uh, we certainly have heard, not just this year, but in previous years, more and more problems with rats in the cities, in the suburbs, and even in rural areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, the smart little critters and they breed like crazy. Um, it's an uphill battle to deal with them. 
And the one common denominator that uh, has not been, I don't think, mentioned this evening is water. Uh, with the drought, every one of those uh, backyards that has a small flock of chickens has a waterer. Uh, many of the homes that don't have chickens have that inner tube or that tire rather, or maybe uh, you know an old dish pan or something that is holding water. Uh, we recently saw four rats, four adult rats, licking the toilet bowl at the store. Not the inside of it, we keep that sealed, but rather there was enough condensation on the exterior that in light of our hygiene, the rats were so anxious for any kind of hydration, they were licking the condensation off of the commode. Water is a um, ingredient in baiting, training, and actually the probably the safest environmental control that we have for rats is uh, a pail of water. Uh, we have been using that at the feed store for the past two months. And uh, I mean, as recently as the past week, I pulled eight juvenile rats out of one five gallon pail of water. Uh, there's no possible harm to any uh, other wildlife. Uh, the owls, uh, the hawks, God bless them. I hope they multiply. We need to do more to foster that wildlife to control it. But, you know, a simple pail of water, yeah. if we restrict their other access to water, can be an effective treatment for the rats. Uh, we do also sell multiple different types of rat bait. And while I'm not a big fan, uh, there are rat baits and we are using uh, two that are nerve toxins and do not have the same effect on the hawks, the owls, uh, or other animals. Our cats, uh, dogs, etc., they will not eat a dead animal by and large. And yet it's their food or the overabundance of it that often is attracting the rats. So that can, uh, I think, give us all some clues. Jack, can I speak? Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, I, I, I just think that there's something that everybody's not hearing is that this particular year, there is there are rats everywhere. I mean, when I tell you, because I deal with a lot of different people and people call me because they think that I can fix things, uh, I have had more than 10 people call me this week because they have rats in their area where they don't have chickens, but they have rats. And I mean, again, it, I think there's something to be said for the fact that we have had a huge drought. And uh, uh, I agree with the needs and feeds that th they are searching for water anywhere they can find it. Uh, it, it's, it is a problem. I get that it's a problem. Uh, it's a serious problem because, you know, rats carry diseases and all that sort of stuff. But I do think that it has to do more the, the abundance of them and in different towns, because I've talked in, to people in different towns as well. And I have a good friend in Attleboro who uh, was talking to me yesterday about their issue, same thing. Uh, I, I think it more has to do with the drought that's drawing them to uh, homes and areas of uh, that 
don't have chickens but do have rats. Okay, thank you. Penny Bennett, did you have your hand raised? Hi, yes, I actually did. Can you hear me? Yes. So I, I, I just wanted to say, obviously there was a perfect storm that happened this year for all these rats to be coming out, coming into where people live because generally they don't want to be near people. But now that they are, the worry is, are they going to stay? So now they have come come to where people are living and realize that they can get food, water, et cetera. And the worry is they're going to stay and they're going to multiply faster than, than we can get rid of them. And I think, like I said on the last meeting, that it's going to be a pronged approach to try to get the population under control, which is where the the rat birth control comes in, which is something that I'm doing at my home to, to try to get rid of them. Something to, as much as I don't like to kill anything, something to kill them that does not cause secondary kill. Because as I had said before, I have seen a decrease in the owls, the hawks, and other natural predators over the past six to eight months. I've, I've seen those things go away. Um, and I think it's because people are seeing rats and they're using rodent side because it's the most readily available um, one when you call an exterminator. That's usually what they use is the rodent side. It's the anticoagulant. It takes days to kill them. And in those days, if they do get caught by a predator, whether it be a hawk, an owl, coyote, dog, cat, whatever, they're alive. The dog or cat eats that, the, the birds eat that, and they die as well. So I'm against the rodent side, but there are other options to try to get them away from the houses. Um, and, and the only other thing I would want to say about the chickens, they may not be attracted to the chicken feed, but rats do like freshly laid chicken eggs. <laughs> they Chicken coops are a draw for rats for whatever reason. They do like, maybe they're not eating the feed, but maybe they're drawn for the water. Maybe they're drawn for the, the freshly laid chicken eggs because they do like that. Um, and I don't think, I'm not proposing that anybody get rid of their chickens because I think everybody should be allowed to raise their own food. But I do feel that there should be some sort of of regulations to or or something to have coops inspected to ensure cleanliness and and make sure that it's not an attractant for rats. Okay, thank you. Uh, do any of the board members have anything more on this topic? Well, I agree with Penny in, in the regard of uh, contra pests. Uh, I think that that's, that is a good um, treatment because it does um, eliminate the, their ability to um, recreate. <clears throat> uh, and um, I think that that's, that's a good thing anyway, whether you have a whole lot of them or two. Tom? Yeah, like um, as Joyce has mentioned there, um, what, what Penny had to say, um, you know, it, and what Rick had indicated, maybe the initial attraction might be water because of the drought situation we're facing, but, you know, the added element of the eggs is probably not helping it from the chickens if they do enjoy the freshly laid eggs. And that probably maybe helps keep them around to they realize they have a food source um, in addition to, you know, seeking water, uh, the water that might be out in these coops um, makes sense. Um, I, I do think is an element here where uh, Penny has a point about um, validating the, um, the habitat itself and making sure that it is being, um, operated in a uh, in the healthiest way possible, uh, which goes to the point of 
establishing some sort of guidelines or regulations with regard to having uh, chickens that is currently goes, I believe, under the radar at the moment. Uh, unless we happen to hear about it, I don't believe that that is something that uh, consistently is um, uh, assessed from the uh, bond book perspective. So maybe something that uh, we would want to consider to look to have a set of reasonable standards that we would want people to follow um, in keeping their uh, their chicken coops and in a in a clean uh, healthy way best as possible. Jack Allen. Um, I, I agree, and if the animal inspector knows about livestock uh, and usually the animal inspector when they're inspecting one person's coop uh, if people are around if the homeowners around or the hobbyist is around uh, they do engage in a discussion now I'm speaking for uh, the practices of our former inspector who unfortunately uh, has moved to Florida um, but I know that, you know, he was very willing to engage, make suggestions, et cetera. He was certainly not the, uh, the police and trying to find someone doing something wrong. Uh, he was always very uh, uh, able to encourage people to uh, do what they're doing and to do it better. Uh, something that uh, uh, former speaker uh, Brandon had brought up. Um, and usually in those discussions, uh, he would find out of someone two or three doors down the street or the next block over that was also a, a hobbyist of some kind. And he would add them to the bond book. That's usually how he was able to do his research and find people that he hadn't inspected before or people that had newly taken on a, a hobby. Uh, so, you know, as time went on that, that he was with us, uh, the ins number of inspections he would do on an annual basis would increase. Uh, and I know this only from him coming to my bond and having a discussion with him while he was at my bond as to what his operations were. Um, I, I think, you know, what everybody has really brought to the board's attention uh, is that not only it, was it a perfect storm possibly for the rodents to come out of the wilderness and to, you know, find other sources of food and water, but most likely this needs to be addressed even if next year isn't a perfect storm because the, the population of these rodents has increased to such a volume that people in areas that never saw these rodents are seeing them. So uh, we, we all need to do as residents of the community everything we can to prevent encouraging these animals, these rodents to hang around uh, and to if we can't get them, you know, uh, we, we have to decrease the population uh, because, uh, you know, so the, the bucket of water that Rip spoke about, if we put the uh, birth control method in that bucket. Um, anybody that makes it out of the bucket will at least uh, be sterile. Um, you know, and the ones that don't make it out of the bucket, we've, we've eliminated. Um, I mean, occasionally I have an above ground pool. Occasionally I've found a mouse in the skimmer. Um, it, it, it happens. Um, fortunately, it doesn't happen a lot. If it did, I would definitely be alarmed. But uh, I think that all the speakers have definitely brought to our attention that every resident in the town needs to do everything they can to have best practices uh, to hopefully uh, tilt the scale and the population of these rodents in, in the other direction. Um, the only thing that I can offer at this time um, is that you know, the board uh, will, you know, continue to monitor this and, you know, post as many suggestions uh, on the website as possible. Um, 
and try to find, you know, a way of alerting the people in the community that maybe haven't had this unpleasant experience that, uh, you know, everybody needs to do what they can do. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to take the last three hands raised uh, that we have on file. So I'm going to go for Rick from Feeds and Needs first. Thank you. Uh, the person who uh, mentioned public awareness and information, I think hit the nail on the head. Uh, it certainly is a very widespread problem, uh, not just townwide, but statewide, maybe nationally. And the more information that goes out there, to the uh, people who are not at this meeting tonight, the better off we all will be. Uh, insofar as barn inspections, uh, we have chickens at home. We've also had goats, sheep, etc. We've had barn calls here for 25, 26 years at least. And we pay taxes on the animals that we own. Uh, so there's, uh, there is the revenue aspect of that, but uh, those people who do the inspections often have been able to uh, pass along useful information. If nothing else, beware of a certain problem, and that's great. But uh, mention was made of the birth control, contra pest. Uh, for the rats, we have been using that for two or three months. I'm still catching juvenile rats, uh, although the numbers certainly have been shrinking uh, in the past month. And, uh, you know, I applaud that, but uh, it takes a wholehearted, across the board effort to deprive them of food, deprive them of water make them uncomfortable. Yes, we are also using cayenne pepper because uh, they don't like the smell. So call it aromatherapy if you like. Ammonia. <laughs> uh, and ammonia. We're working at it. Got to plant some mint. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, you can plant more mint around the house and in the gardens. They don't like the smell of mint. Uh, so we'll try a little horticultural therapy as well. Uh, I do thank you for the fact that you have uh, engaged this effort tonight. And uh, I wish you uh, great success with it. If anybody has any questions of me, I am available through the uh, feed store or through the nursery much of the week. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions to help them to uh, bring this problem under control. And the good and bad one sides. All right, thank you very much, Rick, for offering your services. We really greatly appreciate that. Uh, Richard Green. Yeah, one, one thought I had is to make people aware. What about the reverse 911 call to tell people there's a problem in town and do et cetera, you know? Keep your food in. Don't leave water out. But that's, that's a what, great we're, idea. what we're not reaching, though, is the person that says, the hell with you. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm, I agree with everybody that the rats are probably leaving water sources. But now they never they found another food source, like Penny mentioned. So they're not going to leave because they got a food source. And if a particular house or neighbor is doing something that says, I'm going to keep doing it, and here's the rat. So we're, we're all dealing with it. Your thoughts? All right, let me just get Jim for our final comment, then Tom Fickner. Hi there. This is Jim Antronijan. Uh I'm at 17 Bicknell Drive, and um, I've seen some rats around here, so that's why you interested me in this call this evening. Um, uh, I actually spent all day making some of my own jerry rigged water tr type traps out of five gallon pails and uh, took one of my big traps and uh, that was for bigger animals and tried to close the holes up so I could catch some rats. 
But my issue, guys, is, and this is not criticism at all. I think everybody's ideas on here are great. But, you know, there's only 20 people on this call for the whole town. That That's a that's a little bit of a problem, too. And I think this is a really unusual circumstance. I've been here for 30 years, and we'll all agree, this is kind of unusual what's going on. So right. we probably got to get some kind of professional help, you know, and that tells us a directive to a more wider scale than just 20 people on you know, a priority order on what we need to do, because, you know, we're focusing on chickens because I agree that's probably one of the issues. But I mean, I got people on my street that there's like a hundred dogs now since of COVID, everybody got a dog and, you know, everybody's letting their dogs walk out and go right across the street from my house. And I hear that that is a problem too for rat where rats can go after dog feces. So I don't want to get into the 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 the, the tactics because that's what we're doing tonight. It seems like we got a lot of tactics going on, but we need a strategy. That's what I would suggest to everybody here. And I really appreciate everyone's input tonight, but we got to have an overriding strategy on what we're going to do because all I'm hearing is a lot of tactics and, and it's only to a small group of people. And that's the only comment I wanted to make. Appreciate the fact that we had an opportunity for this call tonight, too. Okay, thank you, Jim. Tom, you've had your hand raised? And you're on mute. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jim, for the, uh, the input there. You raised some very good points. Um, you're right, I think from a notification standpoint, right, there's only a small group at the moment that are part of this call. Um, I would say from a notification standpoint, something that we could do as a board, as a department, is to implement a, um, a you know, a, a full town communication um, overall that outlines um, the, the issues and uh, the solutions that could be presented. Um, and I would, you know, there's different ways of doing that. I would say that uh, I know Richard, you brought up the 911. Um, I think there's probably so much information that surrounds this problem. I think the best way to, the better way to do it would probably be in a, in a very good detailed um, informational uh, newsletter or, or letter, if you will, um, that would go out to everyone in town uh, in the form of a mailing. Uh, you know, a direct mailing to to every home, um, I think might be the best way to reach everyone in the community. Um, and then, of course, have um, references within that letter that people could then go to and use as a consistent uh, point of updating, whether it be uh, our website or uh, different links or what have you. Um, with regard to the the point that was made about individuals who may want to take the approach of I'm just going to do what I want to do. Um, I, I understand that that that's a tough one. Um, that I don't know how to address that one. I, I'd like to think and I know this is probably um, unfortunately not always realistic. I'd like to think that uh, everyone in a neighborhood, everyone could be uh, neighborly and agree that this is a a problem within a neighborhood uh, that everyone could unite and act together um, for combating it. But I understand that you're probably going to have, and I, I'm aware of particular situations where we may have a, um, you know, an individual or two that uh, just going to want to do what they want to do. And I guess it comes down to whether or not it's the approach that that individual may want to take is in violation of any particular um code or guideline and um you know like i said people ha do have the ability to um to do things on their personal property um uh, i know that there's some things folks you know can't do and i know there's some things that folks could do to try to rat to rectify this problem would not be appreciated by their neighbors because of what that might do to other uh, animals in the neighborhood. 
Um, I understand that. I'm aware of that. Um, how best to get to that uh, individual? Maybe that's the case where uh, a direct approach from the Board of Health um, may be the way to go. Um, maybe an actual personal visit um, may help to enlighten um, certain individuals on the on the direction that they may be considering that might not be considerate to their neighbors. Um, I would uh, be all for that, kind of like how we've been trying to address the rooster issue um, at a particular location. Um, so I would I would entertain that um, and try to impress upon certain folks. Um, you know, what could be a, a, a better way to go as opposed to what they may just want to do haphazardly and in spite of everybody in the neighborhood. Um, but it's going to be very difficult to control it, it, control individuals. Um, the only way that that's going to probably happen um, if it's someone that is in this hobby uh, is to have an actual uh, regulation in place that then uh, gives enforcement uh, ability um, to the board. Uh, unlike the rooster issue that we're trying to curtail, uh, that's being handled as a nuisance, and it still is a nuisance. And in, in my view, we kind of get, we started on that topic and then we kind of moved over to the rodent topic pretty quickly. But just getting back to the rooster, my view is, um, if indeed that that location has not been in compliance, then then the next step needs to take place. Now we seem to have a, a you know, I guess a difference of uh, a viewpoint here where we're hearing that they no longer have it, um, but it's believed that there's something still going on. So I guess we have to try to, you know, validate that again and just make sure that, you know, things are what they are. I do, I do know that, uh, you know, with multiple uh, chickens in the area, um, could there be multiple roosters um, and other properties? But, you know, at least we can try to focus and try to validate this one property we've been trying to deal with to, to see if indeed, have they not been in compliance with what we laid down? If they weren't, uh, if they're not, then my view would be they, we would take the next step, which would be to, you know, remove it. Um, and, uh, and create a more uh, an enforcement action there. But um, yeah, um, and with regard to information, I'm all on board. We're trying to do something um, town-wide, uh, communication-wise. <clears throat> and actually what I'd like to do is incorporate, uh, you know, uh, Rick's um, ideas. And maybe uh, we do a follow-up meeting with him if he's not on the call still, but to uh, uh, present what uh, might be a communication to the town and incorporate his experiences and make sure we're capturing all the, the different options so it could be laid out very clearly and concisely for everybody in the community to kind of all try to follow the same same practices. So, um, that's that's all I had. Jack, Alan. Alan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, because of time constraints and other issues we have to get to, I'd like to kind of close this out, but I'm going to close it out with this statement, if I may. Um, I, I, I'm hearing that, you know, there may be people out there that want to do their own thing or not want to combat this issue and may not be as agreeable uh, as, you know, one neighbor may be a kind of a, a holdout. Um, and also, I'm hearing that there are only 20 people on this call, even though, you know, it's a, a good thing to be listening to. Uh, in the meantime, please talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers, talk to anybody you know in town about this issue. And then there'll be that many more people that aren't on this call that will be aware of the situation. Uh, and if you have a neighbor who is a holdout, 
who wants everybody else in the neighborhood to do the work, find a, find a way of encouraging them to join the team so that we can, you know, combat this. Um, even though, like I said, the, the weather and the conditions might be different next year, it sounds as though uh, the experts have spoken that we have to deal with this issue regardless and we have to deal with We lost your microphone, Alan. I'm sorry. I know we can hear you. Okay. I apologize. Uh, so, like I said, I want to close this out, but please talk to your neighbors. Try to get everybody that's not on this call on board and to act in any way they possibly can that's responsible. And the board will put some kind of a publication together and find a way to alert as many people in the community as possible. Thank you all for uh, calling in on this issue. I greatly appreciate it. Um, but we do have to move to number four, the Hastings Street Project. Jack, please. Thank you all. OK, that is specifically for Tom Ryder. Tom Ryder, thank you for joining and staying on with us for so long. Hey. All right, so this is basically for Tom Ryder and Joyce because you guys had some uh, some discussions they have about the Hastings Street project. Joyce, um, I I don't know what Joyce. the status is of the uh, of the project. Um, I I think uh, you guys had some questions regarding the soil testing. I I certainly did. I um, I know that Stephen is going to be doing some more witnessing some more testing soon. Um, I'd, I would definitely like to be part of that um, process and and see what's happening there. OK, yeah, so the reports uh, show high ground water. Um, and uh, some uh, fairly good soils um, like a loamy sand. Uh, it is um, according to the soil maps. That's pretty much what is there uh, up in the uh, this is around the uh, driving range. Um, I, I did not um, go from test pit to test pit at the time. Um, that was uh, about a year ago. Uh, yeah, uh, September. Uh, Lenny, uh, Lenny was the inspector there, so I actually dropped him off. They took him in a golf cart. They took him to each hole. I right. went and did another soil test, I think, uh, in Menden while he was on that site, and uh, and then I returned to pick him up. Um, and um, I looked at one test pit, but I did not go through all of them. I just went out just to take a look uh, how deep they dug and. You know, sure enough, there was redox, uh, high groundwater. I mean, you're talking two feet to groundwater. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I I don't know whether you know this, but I I'm uh, I'm up the street there, and for twelve to fourteen years, I did perk testers in this whole area, and and in my opinion, uh, the the whole this the whole part of the hill is uh, glacial till. Um, and you know, I have it here, and uh, I, I know I've done tests all down the street. And when you have older houses, then you see that they've had to have new septic systems, and they're all raised, uh, i.e., the one exactly across the street from me is you know, raised. And that perk test was uh, just under 60 minutes. Uh, an inch so and because it was pre-existing lot they ended up putting a huge big system there to work it out but um, I'm really concerned about that yeah I, I think uh, I think they have to do more soil testing um, in in anyways because um, I think they were just doing some preliminary uh, but I think they want it on record uh, what what is that 35 Hastings yeah. yes yes um, oh, I, I, the the current the current address that I'm seeing listed on the perk test that was done, Tom, it's 37 Hastings. 
I think it's okay. 35, 37. I think they, they use that, both of those for that. That yeah. group, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the soil map uh, indicates um, that this is a situate fine sandy loam. Um, yeah, so it's a landform of till, till plains uh, right. at the foot slope. Um, and, but the uh, reported so, soil profile is a, a gravelly sandy loam to loamy sand, uh, but high, high groundwater. Uh, it right. doesn't. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. so it doesn't really have a it doesn't have a great uh, hydrologic soil group uh, because of that. But it but it is uh, um, the infiltration rate, not the park rate, is very good. Um, so, um, but the park rate, I think they they got a decent park rate. But again, uh, I know I know they said they had a nine minute per inch park rate, which yeah, which is nothing short of miraculous. Yeah, especially with the high groundwater. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, it is. yeah, that I mean, that basically. Would be a miracle. Uh, nine, nine and 15, uh, uh, five and 10 and eight. So they've done they show five. Yeah, uh, so the lowest is five and the highest is 15. Yeah. I, I'm I'm anxious for Stephen to d redo them and have them be redone, and I, I'd like to be there. I, I think I've already spoken to Stephen. He he's he knows that. So okay, have they um, filed? Or are they going to file for another? I for have not received any uh, new applications for the Perkle deep tests. Okay, I do not have a plan. Um, I'm just double checking here. Uh, I do not have a plan of the locations, so that's important too. Uh, do they have a concept proposed plan of what they're planning on doing? Yes. They do? Yeah. Well, they have a concept plan. They've got 27 houses planned and. Um, OK, like, like a. Um, 27 okay. houses in, I, I have a picture of it somewhere. I could get it and show it to you, but. Um, is, it, is this going through planning board? I'm sorry to interrupt. Is this going through planning board? It's going through, yeah. Okay, so we should enter comments mm -hmm. uh, to the planning board. Uh, you wanna, can uh, somebody email me the concept and then I can take a look. Um, I, I can visualize where I saw them dig the test pits. So just confirm what where it was. Um, I'm, talk, I'm talking like 100 yards or more from the driving range uh, driveway. Right. That is where they started and they went through the field. Um, this yeah. this is this is down more on down near Washington Street on the Washington Street side where they're going to put all these houses. OK, I did not see seven houses is, are on the Washington Street side. And it's um, it's the the they're going to put a, a huge septic system for those twenty seven houses. Do you happen to know that location address or? Well, they're using it all as thirty seven thirty five Hastings. That that okay. whole development, it, they're using that as that. Okay. Well, yeah. Without the locations, it's kind of tough know. to gauge. I know. Yeah. yeah. So let's uh, let's have let's uh, make sure the planning board sends us off uh, uh, copies of the plans and the application, and make sure that we respond to comments. Uh, one of the comments will be that uh, the board of health believes more soil testing is, is required. Um, that's one of them. You know, you can go and uh, is this like an apartment complex? You think, or is it going to be? No, it's all little individual little houses um, that are. Um, individual lots or or one no, lot? No, all in the same lots. lot. Yeah. Okay. Next to we, we'd want to have a operation maintenance plan for a final septic system. Um, you know, anything on the private wells, right. uh, dump locations. One well. One well for all of them. Right. It could be a public water supply if, if, if it triggers uh, 26 people, 20, uh, 26 units. Right. 
27. It'll be 27. But who's counting? <laughs> it's going to be 27 units? Yes. Okay, so that that will trigger public water supply if it's. Right. Okay. Tom Fickner. Tom Fickner, you want to jump in? Well, I just wanted to ask uh, or just mention uh, the, the, the plans that I'm aware of that we had received. They're kind of the uh, pictorial architectural diagram layouts of the of the property for what they were proposing. Tom, um, as Joyce mentioned, 27 for the two bedroom homes, I believe Joyce was the, Correct. the format. Correct. Right. Um, kind of coming in on a, uh, there'd be two entrance points actually off of Washington Street, almost um, like in a U shape where you come in one end and the houses would line it and almost like a horseshoe come around and go out the other side. And then of course, um, there's the commercial element that would be more on the Route 16 side facing Route 16 uh, and Millville Street that would contain the, you know, the proposed bank, uh, retail store, I think uh, a small plaza that would have some of the small stores in it. And the uh, the plan that- Grocery uh, that store, a grocery store. Grocery store, yeah. Right. And I think, Jack, you have, uh, I don't know if you have it in hand, Jack, right, uh, yourself, but I know in our office we have copies that we can send out to you, Tom, for what we received. Um, and it kind of shows the proposed area for, I think, um, wells and um, um, uh, septic element might have been part of that plan too, or tank positioning, I think is also part of the diagram. Right, yeah. So we can we can get that to you so you can kind of see from a visual perspective what's being, uh, what has been presented. Um, again, it's not, not final. I do know that the, I think they are talking about some minor revisions to what's been presented. Uh, to what extent, I'm not sure, but you know that we're still, that, or I should say not us, but you know, planning is still in conversation, you know, with them and with the project. But um, and conservation, you know, and conservation is as well. Conservation, yeah, yeah, um, which is good. So you know, and as all this kind of plays out, we just we from a BOH perspective, you know, want to, you know, I know we've already been through. Um, uh, uh, perk testing process already, but for the purposes of, I guess, a, a, a validation and comfortability, if you will, um, going through and, and, and doing that process again, um, it, it makes sense given the size and location of what is being proposed and where it's being proposed, just to make sure that all the numbers are, you know, kind of uh where they should be where they need to be with regard to uh you know the um you know the um utilities what have you that you know right. need to be put in right so um and it seemed that i you know joyce can address this i know she did a walkthrough what about a month ago joyce with the with the group correct yeah and very it was very good if i recall very um joyce had very positive things to say it was um, and there seemed to be no no issues with them um, when it was raised about um, no perk testing. Stuff. They yeah. seem very accommodating for yeah. having that assessed. So that's good. Um, it can't hurt. Another set of eyes we do, and you know, just make sure that we're covering all the bases. It's a good sized project, and given the nature of the property, there's a lot of concern, and we just want to make sure this um, it's done right, uh, and um, you know, that's that's so that's that was I think that from my perspective, that's what I want to see happen. I just don't want to, you know, have us lose sight of what uh, we want to make sure happens, you know, correctly. That's all. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so my my opinion is uh, it'd probably be advantageous for them just to make sure that they, um, you know, I don't think they did an, enough soil testing for um, you know, for the systems if you're saying 27 units, um, perhaps that's not the location that they that they choose to put the system. Perhaps they need need uh, to expand it uh, to another location, or uh, who who knows. So, um, yeah, so it probably is more advantageous, anyways, just to uh, to uh, check the area. Um, and again, I mean, we we should get a have them give us a copy of the plan for the location of. Um, where their previous soil testing is, uh, according to the uh, engineer's record, um, and, and that would be verified too. So,
uh, so yes, once once we figure out when uh, the planning board needs the comments, let's let's get that over to them. And um, if you want to address this at the next uh, meeting, we can go over them. Uh, hopefully, that gives us some time to submit. Sometimes right. the turnaround's like two weeks, you know. So. Alan, any thoughts? Alan, you're on the mute. Yes, thank you. Um, Jack, the only thing that I would say to be on the lookout for is uh, when you do get the uh, application, look back at the old application and see how we set the fee. Um, I believe because of the size of the project and the amount of time it's going to take the engineer, uh, et cetera, to be there, uh, most likely all day or multiple days. Um, I believe we left the fee structure for this project open. Uh, and I would assume that if the amount of time is similar to the last round, then the fee should be similar, but it won't be uh, a typical fee. So please, uh, you know, check our records and let's make sure that we, you know, cover our expenses. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else on this topic? John? John Pickner? Yeah, not so much on, on this topic. And is this the only topic that we had Tom on for, out of curiosity? Yes. Okay. Well, just while, while, while I have you, Tom, just a question in general. There is actually another property that um, has come to light um, where I believe this has been an exposed um septic system project that i believe is currently in an abandoned state are there particular guidelines that exist with regard to requirements for closing up um work or or a site um where you start doing work to implement a septic system and you just kind of uh stop the work and things have been left open pits are open Things of that uh, nature. Okay, so uh, so the so the question is, is, is first of all, is this somebody's house, existing house, or is this like a new construction? It's an existing property. It's on uh, Main Street, uh, right around the corner from our office. Uh, they apparently uh, the owner of the property started doing some work to implement a new septic system on the property. There was an individual that had been doing some work. They started you know, some time ago now. I want to say this goes back at least you know, maybe three months, Jack, maybe four months. Yes, and I do possibly. have something to add on to that. Yeah, um, and since then, apparently, you know, holes have been dug. Some of the um, uh, components were laid into the into the pits, and then um, all of a sudden the work stopped, and the construction, the rigging disappeared from the site. And basically, there's been uh, basically open pits that have existed in this property for quite some time. Um, and I just wondered if there's some sort of requirement there that says that, you know, they need to act. I'm not sure what happened. I, I don't think we've reached out to the owner. And I, my understanding is that the owner of this property is the same owner of 106 Millville. If you remember 106 Millville, Tom? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. I believe this is the same owner of this property as well. All right, so let's clarify though. Is, it, is this in house? Nobody's using the septic, right? So this is not open sewage. Right? Uh, correct. There's no, my understanding is no occupants. It's an un, uh, uninhabited uh, dwelling. Okay, and uh, do we, and the owner is not the installer, correct? Correct, they're, they're not. Right. Okay. Um, so they would have to make it safe if they are abandoning the site. Uh, they would certainly have to make it safe. Uh, if it's an open pit, uh, there is Jackie's law uh, prohibiting uh, open trenches. But technically, you know, when you pull a, a board of health permit, you pull in a Jackie's uh, law permit to make sure there's no open trenches, uh, or that they're managed or supervised at the time. So even on their own property, they would have to manage the openings if it's a safety issue, uh, if it's greater than 30 feet in depth. 
um, that's something we have to take a look. Yeah, that was that was my concern was the safety factor that these are okay. open like this and have been open for quite some time. Yep. So we could uh, get uh, get them come back on that, and uh, we uh, we have um, uh, we have the installer on the hook uh, to ask them the status uh, and to make sure they proceed with the uh, continue in the septic system or or. Uh, or just or make it safe and start over again. Uh, I'm sure they don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, this is where I'll let Jack jump in because I think he's got some other details on the property, Jack. Yes, this is the property um, that we were talking about with the open holes on Main Street. Uh, the installer, the new installer, came in and took the retest that Steve Nonatelli um, oh. proctored. Uh, he did pass yesterday. He came in this afternoon when I was leaving to drop off his installer's application. So I just got to process it and he is good to go to install it. OK, is this number nine? Yes, it is. Yeah, OK. OK. Uh, so we can reach out to the engineer too to uh, make sure that they're on track of uh, doing the inspections. Uh, Seth LaJoy is the uh, is the designer. I can reach out to him. Let him know the concerns. Uh, have him stop by, uh, make uh, make his uh, comments, and and make sure that he uh, he proposes uh, modifications to uh, uh, you know to make it safe as well. Um, is, there, is there a plan? Is there an approved plan for the repair? Yes. Yes, it is a very, it's a raised, so it's, it's a huge raised bed. The back, all those areas back there are just high groundwater. Um, right. I don't think they could run the perk, perk tests. The, 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 the water table is so high. Right. Um, and in multiple uh, local upgrade approval requirements, pump system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, when you when you talk about pits, uh, I mean, I'm I'm assuming you're talking about actually digging out where the tanks are supposed to be, because there's no proposed pits. Uh, yeah, it's 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 the uh, yeah it's the exposed uh, um, tank area. Um, yeah. So they actually have components like they started to put it in, and some things laying in the ditches, but they they've been left open. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they yeah. would have make that safe uh, if yeah. it's it's yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, in the in the meanwhile, actually, I, I spoke with Steve uh, yesterday, and we we're going to work together on preparing like a a, a uh, installer's exam uh, that is probably adequate for you know, eighty eight questions is just way too much. Uh, the installers shouldn't be in the uh, board of health office for four hours trying to pass a test. It's not. Right. Let's stick to stuff that is practical, reasonable, and, and required. I mean, these are not people who are just the excavator. You know, they have a duty to, uh, you know, they're bound to the their license, uh, and and to and to make sure that they call for the appropriate inspections and understand how to read a plan and know how to move things around. Uh, yes, they can hire someone who just does an and just does the excavation, but then just not just an excavator, they're an installer. They need to know stuff, but they don't need to be an engineer. So stay away from the engineering stuff, stick to the practical stuff. Darling, so. right. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. OK, that's all I that's all I had. Thank you, Tom. All right, okay, well, good night. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I actually did find the concept plan. I do have it, uh, uh, I think that was from last year. Uh, so if you have an update, uh, let me know. And uh, in, a, in a letter from the planning board, let me know so we can uh, start drafting something together. OK. I have not seen an update. OK. All right. Jack, has anything come to your eyes at all regarding uh, Hastings? Nothing at all. OK. All right. Maybe you can reach out to the planning department, see if they're looking for comments. Yeah, I can ask Gail tomorrow when I see her. OK. All right. Excellent. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Good thank night. you. Good night. OK, next topic is the okay. minimum. I'm sorry. 
So then, sorry. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Jack, but right, uh, go, Alan, sorry. I think, broke up a little bit. Alan, were you speaking? Uh, I haven't said anything yet. I'm too busy coughing and joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next topic is the Men and Tobacco Enforcement Update. I actually did meet with Jody Brigente from the uh, Lemster Tobacco Enforcement. I saw her on, I believe it was Tuesday of last week. Uh, she did go around to all the Men and Six tobacco sale, retail sales stores. Uh, that was her educational uh, visit for each one. Uh, what she did was basically just give them a letter stating what the Massachusetts law is about selling tobacco to people under the age of 21. Uh, she gave them the state signage that each retailer needs to have in uh, in the stores. Um, and she said basically that the educational visits are done. It's going to be two to three weeks before she goes back again and see if they're following the regulations of the laws of Massachusetts. So just want to give you an update that the first initial visit of educational has been completed in Menden. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next topic is the Lake Nipmunk updates. I really don't have that much to update. I have been receiving more uh, septic pumping records around the lake now for some strange okay. reason so that's pretty good because a lot of it i was updating the um chart that i've done in the past and a lot of them i haven't seen pumping records in a few years so now i'm updating that thing again but um choice didn't you say you had mike tatralt as possible for the panel yes he i haven't checked in again with him because i didn't know where we were how where we were at with it but he was he said he would do that because I think it's important to have someone who actually does the installations of these things, you know, to be to give us some thinking and thoughts and stuff. Tom? Yeah, and also, too, I know we've uh, Joyce and I have had a couple of discussions on this with regard to um, assessing the status of these systems around the lake and the methodology by which to do so. Uh, so the concept of a dye test uh, was discussed and um, which I know we, we had talked about as a board sometime back and we kind of wondered whether or not what kind of um, ability we had to uh, implement that or, or make that happen um, and I you know, in conversation, I think Trace had a very good point. I mean, this is a, this should be viewed, I believe, as a pub, public health issue. And as such, under those guidelines and under the concern for all the residents who utilize that lake, um, I think that um, we would have the, um, the ability to, and again, presentations, everything here, but the ability to uh, implement such an action for all these residences along the, along the lake uh, to implement the diet test to validate that all these systems are functioning. And and that they are they are systems that are systems. <laughs> not not like cesspools and stuff. You know. Right. Well I think the but mapping I, I was thinking about calling <coughs> actually and and talking about to them about how you how we could go about doing a, that kind of a diet test. You know, to see what what their recommendation was on that, I I was going to do that this week. Okay, yeah. I mean, I can't see. I, I know that you know. I would like to think that folks would look at it as a, a comfort factor to validate that the system is working. However, I could see the other side of it where somebody might find out that the system fear. is not working. Fear. The fear and have factor. a concern about that. Right. Yeah, but. Absolutely. That's, you know, you know, that would be an unfortunate thing. But if we have some ill effects of a non working system, that's not working property and properly and it's affecting the um, the lake and the health of the lake. Well, that that really has to be addressed. Uh, in addition, in addition to. I wanted to mention something that uh, Jack had told me about uh, a week or so ago 
when we had that huge uh, deluge of rain. Um, Jack was shown a video that was taken of that, um, I don't know what you want to call it, an outlet pipe that's down near the um, the cove area where the uh, the yacht club is. Yeah. That runs into the lake. Yep. And um, although I haven't seen it yet, the Jack had seen it. It's it was quite quite the flow of water that was coming in I from mean, outside yeah. sources. Yes. And I mean, I would call that a stormwater issue. Right. right. And I, you know, it just validates. I mean, uh, how the heck is stormwater being allowed to run into that lake? Right. And that that because Route 16 is a state highway. That, so that that is a state issue as well in, in because of the road the way because a lot of it's coming off the road and a lot off the hill and then down into the road right so so i guess that would you know that would uh take into account having conversations would that be dep uh, a, I, I think we could start there you know um Would, wouldn't it be mass highway? highway mass highway yeah okay exactly. but uh, you know and DEP would have the, the control over Mass Highway as well. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. uh, I think I think I'll, I'll just talk to them if that's OK. I, I didn't you know, I was going to talk to you about it before and I didn't we didn't get around to it, but I wouldn't have done it without talking to you. But I think that, you know, to get their thoughts about how to, you know, manage that. I think yeah. it's, it would be a good idea too, because I mean, it, it is a great, it's a great natural resource that we don't want to lose. I know that uh, previously um, by a, a private citizen, a dye test of, uh, of a certain nature had been performed a little while back that uh, where dye had been, I don't know if you folks know where the old uh, train track trestle used to run by the uh, old Taft road there. Yeah. I'm yeah. across 16. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that's, it's more like a, like, almost looks like a trail now. They had taken up the track, so it's kind of like a trail that runs on the backside of Old Taft. Right. Well, down, down the hill on the left side is like a, I don't know what you want to call it, a, a gathering, you know, a natural water hole type of thing. And I know that a dye test has been done there. And um, uh, within 10 minutes, uh, which I was surprised at the, how quickly it happened, but, um, what I was told within 10 or 15 yeah. minutes it showed up in the lake. Yes. So that that was a that was kind of an eye opener. Right. And I well. think that, you know, I think that if you've got a failed septic system, it's going you're going to be able to see it. If you've got a, a tight tank that's been put in that, you know, a, a lot of the old tight tanks were were, um, cop, uh, you know, put together and, and sort of sealed together. But that ceiling has, you know, deteriorated and, you know, so it's, there's all kinds of things there. And, and I think there are people that don't even have, they have cesspools. Well, I believe we have it. Uh, you, you talked about the um, uh, knowing what people have. I think the mapping component has been completed. Is that correct, Jack? Yes, there is a mapping component that tells us what people have, but it all depends on um, the pumping record itself because they would tell us what type of system they have on the pumping record. Okay. All right. And there were some, there were properties that were listed as, I believe, cesspool um, on that on that spreadsheet. Correct. Yeah. So. Alan? But, Alan, yeah, Alan. Um, do we still have the uh, the funding that would help uh, people finance uh, repairs? I, I remember at one time we had an account that had money that uh, people could borrow at like a 5% rate um, to help people uh, upgrade. Do we still have that uh, function? Well, it, the, the function itself exists, the, um, but I do not know about the status of the money. Uh, it was not always available. It kind of was sometimes, we one of those things where the program money was put toward the program 
and it would be available at other times because the budgetary elements I believe that went on went on within the state there wouldn't the money would not be there uh, so it was not a consistent availability of money but um, there were times when the money was there you know we there'd be an opportunity for someone to take advantage of that so if they had a system that was in need of repair they could potentially look to that as a source of funding at a very attractable uh, interest rate yeah but that would be something that uh, I think Jack you know you might have to we might have to investigate because I'm not oh. sure what group uh, where that came through to be honest with you okay the reason I'm asking is if we knew ahead of time that that was available that might help somebody who was nervous feel a little better that right not only could they upgrade their system but we could help them with the ability to finance that new system yeah and that might take some of the angst out of the equation right so you know it would be nice to know what the status of that opportunity is before we started knocking on doors and asking if we could do some kind of a die test my suggestion might be you no know, you're right i mean i think we have to do some preliminary things before we do the die i mean um and thank you joyce for you know offering to reach out to dep there and just trying to get some validation of the of this direction right. um but um i'm just gonna i was gonna suggest maybe jack if you wanted to make a a reach out uh to missy she might be able to point you in the direction of the the source for that funding okay and um you know um who the contact was the main contact for you know validating its status okay. because it's something it's a it's a it's a resource that every board of health has the ability to potentially tap from in every community that would be great yeah yeah oh thank you i, I like i said i just think it might relieve some of the angst yeah yeah for sure Okay, any other late nipmunk updates from anybody else? Well, I'm, I'm good at the moment, I think. Well, I think we just got to keep it on our radar. Um, don't 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 want to lose sight of it. That's it's an important, important issue. Uh, and as far as that panel goes and, you know, discussions, um, I would like to see that happen uh, as soon as possible over the I'll call it the off season. So that we're, you know, have as many things in place and as much education uh, on board um, so that we're, you know, prepared for the opening of the beach next year and maybe how to keep it open and how to test it better and how to get more people using it. Um, unfortunately, this year, uh, a lot of the issues seem to be brought to us after the beach was already in operation. Um, so I, I really like to be prepared for next season. So, uh, as many opportunities as we can, um, to, you know, meet with the Lake Nipmuc Association again, over what I'll call the off season, um, as possible, um, as far as the, the panel that we would like to put together, um, the only caution I have is putting the panel together so that it's not too large a panel so that we're not giving people or even ourselves getting too much information at one time. Um, I would rather have another meeting and have different people speak at that meeting um, because I really want everybody to focus and get as much out of this as they can. Um, so what do we know, have? What do we, excuse me. What do we have uh, currently for confirmed um, participants in this panel, Jack? Nowhere. Say again. Nowhere. Oh. Well, you have me. There <laughs> you go. We got it. We got her. We got the, the main. That's all girl. we need. There you go. And then, and then, uh, I I think I'm pretty sure uh, that Michael is Michael Tatro is willing to be a participant uh, as well. Yeah, and, you know, if we got somebody that had some testing knowledge, you know, someone from Microback or, or whatever lab yeah. is now doing our work, 
Um, so I did, know did we not hear back from the lab, Jack? Didn't we reach out to the lab? We did, and I'm trying to think now. But I do remember when you you were like sitting behind me when I was typing up the email. Yeah. I got to go through my emails because I don't know if I heard back from Microback about that. Okay. Uh, and then um, I had mentioned, you know, maybe somebody, I know the town of Milford did a huge project at the, uh, I'll call it the Dilla. Cedar Street Swamp. Yeah, yeah, Dilla Street. Um, yeah. They dredged okay. it and they brought it back and that's right adjacent an old landfill. So if we could get somebody that was maybe involved in that project, um, I definitely think someone from a testing lab um, would be very important because that seems to be one of the issues we have. Um, Tom Ryder, from a, an engineering standpoint, possibly, he may have something to offer. Um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, you know, if we got someone from Mass Highway or stormwater management, but that you know, would be that would be good. Yeah, maybe you know, maybe you know, four people at the most. Right. Yeah. For meeting number one, and then for meeting number two, depending upon how the first meeting went, we might want one or two of those original panelists to come back and add one or two different panelists to get some some different information and to reinforce some of the information we got or maybe couldn't cover because of time from the first meeting so that we keep we keep building uh, mm -hmm. and I want to keep everybody's interest so that's my my only caution in my own mind is how to limit and vary that panel so that everybody gets as much out of it as as they can because the off season will go by quick. It will. Right, yeah. no kidding. You know, feel one of the other things that I, I was thinking about was that having, you know, gone, gone to graduate school and stuff like that, like uh, Mass School of Pharmacy and Worcester Polytech, they're all, they are very interested in this kind of thing that we might be able to get like, and I don't know how, you know, I don't know how that's done anymore, but I'm willing to just check with one of the, both schools and see if they have some class that they would be able to, you know, do send somebody out and do these testing things, you know, and they'd learn and we wouldn't have to pay for their learning and we would get the, we have the advantage then of, of you know, that getting all that information, which I think is, you know, I, I will definitely have to look into that, you know, and see if they, they're doing anything since the school year is just starting. I think that might be a good time, you know. No, well, absolutely. With regard to the testing, I, I'd like to uh, note here and now for the coming season that we um, look to change our methodology uh, of what has been happening with how we're testing the beach and expand it. Uh, and I think, to be honest with you, I'd also like to incorporate testing in the lake in general as part of that. I do believe that our budget would cover such a thing without, a, you know, any extra uh, budgetary concern, to be quite honest with you. Um, well, uh, uh, back in the day, I, I hate to say this, but because it, it's, you know, what it sounds like. Uh, back in the day, we we did testing with uh, a lab that was up in Sterling, I think, and they did. They would go in a canoe, and I would go with them, and we would go to different places, like different houses at different times, and and um, like the restaurant and the we would do the island around the island because there was somebody that had a, a little shack on the island and mm -hmm. we would do all those things that was all part of the testing back then you know i don't know if they're just testing the beach or if they do any other testing around but i mean again back in the day we did it all over well i think we need to go back to that um i think that right now the board of health has only been uh, providing oversight with the testing at the beach area because that is our direct oversight 
and yeah. responsibility. Um, I know that the Lake Nimuk Association has been involved with acquiring uh, or working with the lab to do some other testing. But to be quite honest, I know, I think that it, this the approach is better, is better centralized through one entity. Right, um, uh, for sure, right. And I believe I the, the Board of Health carries greater weight right. with regard to any kind of test results um, right. being able to be utilized. Um, it just, it does mean we do have to use a state certified lab, right. uh, but there are many out there. Um, but I, I, I do believe that we need to go back to an expanded version of testing right. uh, on the beach itself and the lake water, uh, right. to be quite honest. And then we become the focal for getting right. that information to all the folks out on the right. lake, keeping them informed and you know, right. part of that whole communication thing that we're looking to, well, actually, I think is now set up. Uh, Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, that we were doing with uh, reverse 911. We have all the folks of the association, I think, that are on board. So if we have to do any kind of notification about the beach closing or something, at um, those correct, are, right, Jack? Okay, correct. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but you know, I would think too. We want to create probably a even an internal uh, mailing or email list or something of all the folks we could shoot out. You know, a communication about test results and you know. Just keeping them informed on a more, you know, consistent basis. Uh, that, would, that would be my uh, that would be my thought. In the meanwhile, I'll check with DEP and do different things in, that we spoke of and get back to you. Okay. Great. No, absolutely. I, I think one of the questions that I would have for someone from a lab is there seems to be a lot of um, a lot of waiting between the testing, the test results, and the time it takes to get the results back to us. So I would be very interested in if there was another method or a way to expedite that. Um, I do realize that it has been said that the sample has to, um, the test takes a while, right? 24 hours or whatever. Right. But in in the world we live in, I, I would think that it you know it may be possible to find a a, a different method so that we could expedite that. Um, I, I don't know until I talk to someone who is involved with doing those type of tests. Thank I you. do I do believe Dan Byer did send out an email to Microback uh, to our representative. And he did ask her, Brayton, Brayton Donar, I believe her name is, why the difference of the 24 hour test that when he did the second retest, it came back in 18. And I'll have to find that email and forward it to you guys. But uh, he basically told her, no, I want every single test regardless to be within the 18 hour period, not no more 24 hours. So I think there was some miscommunication either on their part or Menden's part, I don't know. But for some reason, we were on the later part of being test results. Okay, I, I didn't know if there was a incubation period, you know, that was in, in order to do the test. So that's kind of my question is, I didn't know if there was another test that could be done, another testing method that yeah. could be done on the actual sample. All right. Uh, just some way to expedite, expedite the whole process. All right. It seems like there's too much downtime in between drawing the test, performing the test, and getting us the results. Correct. Now, that might be the best thing that's out there that's available. And if that's what it is, then we have to live with it. But I really want to ask that question um, so that, you know, we're not losing all that beach time, so to speak. Correct. Thank you. Anything to add, Tom? Uh, nope, I, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm technology. I'm technologically challenged this evening. <laughs> All right, so that's it. Unless anybody has any other topics not anticipated within the 48 hours. No, I don't. I'm good. <laughs> Same here. Hey, All right, so up at the two hours. Hey, not bad. 
Okay. All right, so if we're looking at another two weeks, that would be September 21st. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that date. Joyce, good with that date? I'm good with that date. And Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I can make that work. Thank you. Are we doing 7 or 7.30? 7. 7, okay. Right, Joyce, you're done golfing? Yeah. Yep. All right, thank you. All right, so the next board of health meeting will be on September 21st at 7 p.m. Okay. Are we going to do it uh, remote? Is that the plan? Remote's fine with me. Okay. All right. I mean, not that I don't like hanging out with you guys and gas. Ah. Ah. Yeah, that was an awesome uh, spinach and feta Alan, last night, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had just made homemade bolognese so i was already full i couldn't try it sorry uh, <laughs> homemade bolognese oh i'm gonna have to get a sample of that joyce <laughs> yeah you're nice. supposed to share yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so i i guess the one little tidbit before we um vote to close the meeting um so jack you're going to uh continue to post any rodent information that you can possibly post on the website for now? Yes, I do have two on the website now. Uh, one was the West, uh, West. what was that town you told me about? West Boylston, yeah. That yeah, West Boylston's on there too. So there's okay. a Menden one and basically West Boylston one. Okay, because we, we, we are going to have to try to head that off uh, and get, you know, people on board to do what they can do uh, right in their own home in their own neighborhoods right uh, so that doesn't uh continue to haunt us right i, right. I definitely you... i definitely think that it is a town-wide issue yeah sure. and as rip so cool said and and this is a guy right. that's been around forever uh um i mean like i said i met him 40 years ago um, when you were two uh yeah i wish <laughs> Um, he was working at Western Nurseries and he had started the wholesale yard back then. And he was just a, an awesome mentor. But anyway, um, you know, we, we're going to have to find a way to, you know, get as much information out to people as possible. I mean, with the cryo down right now, um, that's kind of a handicap. Because the right. cryo is always a great way to get information know, out. All over town. Um, right. I'm sick over the fact that it's, you know, closed down. I'm hoping only temporary. Um, because that was a great resource to get information out. Well, I think the kind of information that we have to get out is going to be very uh, involved. Uh, for, I, might, I don't know what you folks thought about my... Uh, uh, thought on doing an actual mailing to all the residences in the town of Minden? Yeah, what, whatever we have to do to get it in everyone's hand. And I, I mean, this is, a, a, you know, probably a public service emergency almost. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, more and more people are seeing this. And I was not aware or I didn't think of the component about our domestic animals food. Um, I feed my dog inside, but there are people that have their dog fed outside. Um, you know, I, I was but aware that all kinds of things. I think it's 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 feces, pet feces, yeah, you know, uh, sheep feces, lamb feces. All, all, it's all of the above that attract them. But right. what's happened is since I think it really has to do with the drought. Right. I think the water was the best, the one right. item that was brought up that was the key to this whole issue. Water because of the drought. Right. And unfortunately compounded by the fact that now they're also seeing other sources in addition right. to the water with, as Penny pointed out, uh, chicken eggs that appear to be an attraction. Yeah. Maybe not so much it's the feed. Well, you know, maybe when, you I say, thought, when you say chicken eggs, I mean, just to be just to have a, another uh, thing on chicken eggs, people 
get their eggs. If they've got chickens and they're getting eggs, they get their eggs every morning. They, they don't leave them out and say, oh, let's leave the eggs out. Oh, blah, blah. They have a nesting box. They keep them. They're, they're getting, they're collecting their eggs. I mean, okay. so, I mean, I didn't want to say anything about that, but I mean, I think that's like way down on the list of, okay. of, yep. of things. But yeah, I mean, we had two squirrels. We, we keep a rain barrel. Uh, you know, so that, I mean, we've got that whole roof of barn. So when it rains, I mean, that rain barrel, barrel feels that we had two squirrels uh, drowned in there because they were trying to get water mm -hmm. and they, it, the, the rain barrel is, is like a, a hard plastic. So they lost their grip when they smelled that there was some water in there and they were floaters. So, I mean, right, I've but, ne we've never seen that before. Yeah, ever. I mean, you know, we, we all probably have to look a little deeper into our practices. Right. Um, because of the extreme conditions. But if the population in town, in the state, as Rip said, it could be in the country. Right. Has reached a point where the normal predators can't control the population. We have to step in. Right. And we can't wait till next year. Right. We have to we, we, we have to step in now. And so everybody has to look a little closer at their practices. Like he, he mentioned, it could be a trash can cover that's upside right. down that's collecting water. You know, normally we look at things like that when we have a mosquito problem. Right. Right. Well, mosquitoes Same aren't thing. biting. Right. We might oh. not be as prone to empty that bird right. feed or uh, empty right. that trash can cover that blew right. up uh, and what? i think i think that what jack sent us um oh that was great yeah i i think that wouldn't that wouldn't hurt to send out jack do you i could send it out i mean i think that i i like that i think that that's true i think that contrapest is is a good thing too but and the the rat x if it's true i mean i tend to be a little suspicious about those things because you know I don't want my cat I have two cats that are out they're outdoor cats but they they come in at night but they are outdoors the during and the where day. do you feed them Joyce I feed them in the house all right just check yeah. it yeah yeah yep <laughs> well I think that that flyer and along with uh, additional info incorporated from Rick because uh, I think he's got some great insight all right. I think a continued conversation with him and and mapping out what we put out to the residents right. in town, right? Combine these these things together. I think we'll we'll format right. what we want to do and right. incorporate but some I, sort of I, link I reference. Love this. I love that's this. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was yeah, really I, great. And actually, it's it's Rip, R I P. Oh, I'm sorry, Rip. Okay, yeah. thank Rip, you. Rip, so cool. Okay. And and oh, he yeah. is he's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. Um, that's nice. That's a good. That's a that's a good um, addition, you know, to have some that kind of. Well, well yeah. I mean, you, you take something like that and you print it on both sides. Right. Yeah. And then you know the, the next thing is the the distribution issue as to how you get that out. Right. What the most, you know, efficient effective and cost effective way. way is to get it out. Right. Well, I think the most effective way, irrespective of cost, is a mailing to every resident. OK, I know that's costly. There's the cost to that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the only way you're going to reach everybody is through the mail. All right. OK, um, the mailer that we do for trash. That goes out once a year. Mm -hmm. um, we could that probably is, that is paid by E.L. Harvey. Oh, OK. That's part of the right. contract. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know if that was a way for us to guesstimate what it might be to get something like that out well um, we do one we do one for senior the senior discount uh similarly it may not hit everybody but that's a good mass actually we just did actually we did a mass mailing on that i think this past season actually all right so maybe we can look back and see what that cost was mm -hmm. just to give us kind of a, a a ballpark budgetary number i mean obviously i mean we've printed some things up that have gone in the crier 
and I think I we know. spent like six hundred bucks for printing. Yeah. That sound right? Yeah. So I mean, you know, six hundred bucks for printing. Is it another four hundred for postage? Well, you multiply. It's easy to figure. You multiply. What's the stamp cost these days? Fifty-five cents. Yeah, but fifty-five times uh, eighteen hundred or two thousand. Oh, what are you? Two thousand homes in town. Twenty-two hundred homes. It would all depend if the town of Menden has a bulk mail in Disha, because that would give you a lower cost of the postage rate. When I did bulk mailings for QBS, I think my stamp cost, if it was, I want to say my stamp cost was like 37 cents, like last year, if I was doing bulk mailing. But bulk mailing, I believe you have to have a minimum, I believe 150 pieces. Well, obviously we're doing the whole entire town. Yeah. But I do, I do not know what the bulk mail rate is now. I don't know if there's a difference from being a town municipality, if there's a difference in that. But I believe back when I did bulk mailing and just as recent as even last year for QBS doing our brochures, I believe it was like 37 cents. It was called mixed AADC, which is basically any zip code number. And I know there was another one that I was looking into. It's called every resident direct mailer that the USPS does as well. Uh, you type in a zip code. I was look, trying to read information on that because I, I want to find out. Like when I was told the town cry was not even going to be possibly even running anymore. Well, great. How do I let the whole entire town of residents know all this like has this waste day, the flu clinic coming up type of thing? Right. Well, I would think yeah, you know we for have those a, things we do we, uh, social media, we do website, um, yeah, yeah the website, we do um, Facebook pages. Uh, there's lots of great links that we can tie to from our own and you know I think incorporating Dan services there is going to be key. Uh, there's some great web there's some great like there's a moms and dads Facebook page out there that's very popular. And I thought the one suggestion I think might have been mentioned last night. I'm not sure who mentioned it was the schools. Yeah. That's an excellent resource right there. You hit the schools and they boom that's gonna that's gonna get out there. That's great. That's a great one. Yeah, just for your information, uh, 1,800 pieces at full postage will uh, cost you like a thousand bucks. Yeah, at 40 cents, if we got a bulk mailing at 40 cents, 2,000 homes, that's 800 bucks. Yeah. So, but I think we have a budget that supports that, to be honest with you. Well, and, and the town website, too. I mean, it can't, yeah. we, can, we can, you know, surround that with, uh, with stuff it, because. You know, some people get the mail, they throw it in the trash. And other people are hanging on to Facebook and the town website and stuff like that. So I think you have to try to think of every avenue. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we can uh, brainstorm and uh, think about this. I'm going to make, uh, well, I'd like someone to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion, we'll adjourn. <laughs> I will second the motion. Okay. All in favor. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for last night. Thank you for tonight. Um, uh, obviously, the the work continues. Right? Yes, we got we got our work cut out for us. We'll good be night, in all. Touch. Good night. All right, good night. Good night, all. Thank you.